and here we are. Let's talk some about flowcharts. Okay. So this is homework seven. Yep, there you go. Flowcharts visually depict a process. They can be really simple. They can be incredibly complex. They use standardized symbols, and for software engineers, people in computer engineering, etc., they have a complex array of symbols. We all only have four. I'll show them to you on the next slide. Right? Flow charting, when you do it with multiple people who do the same job, it's often surprising because they do the job differently. And it's fascinating to watch them argue over the process while they're creating the flowchart and then give their reasons for why they do things in a certain order, et cetera. Uh, what's valuable here, though, is not showing people that it's necessarily different, but allows us to determine what is the best practice, common term. And then from once we determine what the best practice is through measurement, then we can build that into our training program so that people adopt the best practice rather than have variable ways of doing a, a process necessarily. Uh, Flowcharts are instrumental in understanding a process then and also about communicating about a process. So from understanding to training, right, flowcharts entirely necessary. Flowcharts can demonstrate what are called transfer points, and that is areas where measurements should be taken in the process. So when we see something going from one step to the next, if it's critical that this step is performed in a certain way, then that's a measurement opportunity to make sure that we're not passing elements, products, further down the process when they're already out of spec and we're doing additional work to them. So it can become a really big time saver and money saver. Electron, what are you doing? Yeah, I guess he's going to be bashful. This is Electron. We call him Electron because he's never in a predictable spot, right? Kind of like electrons for you physicists. What are you doing, buddy? Okay. Now, flowcharts help us detect unnecessary steps in a process that we can eliminate. And when you start flowcharting, expect to scare a bunch of people because they're going to think you're an efficiency expert and you're looking to eliminate jobs, which is not necessarily the case, right? Uh, flowcharts can alert the workers and managers to obstacles to continuous improvement. Why are we not making any progress here? The flowchart might then determine what is happening there. Right, buddy? I don't see you here too often. So here's our basic flowchart symbols. Now, the process is just a step in the process, right? The, the, the terminator is also the beginning, right? And that's kind of that ovalish shape. The connector is if we need to go to another page, and that quite often happens, right? So we'll see connector might say C page 2, or it might say B, which implies go to subprocess B, et cetera. And, and then the decision process. So those are the basic flow charting symbols. Uh, you can look at the assignment. There's various softwares that are available to do this. Notice I've just constructed these in PowerPoint. PowerPoint will flowchart fine. It's just clunky and laborious. Uh, the one flowcharting software that I gave you a link to will allow you to do, I think, so, I think it was like three charts. And you can save them, you can do them, you can share them, you can do all aspects that the software offers, and it's pretty powerful. Uh, but you only get three before you have to buy it. Right. Also, Visio is connected to Microsoft Office 365, and we used to use Visio way back in the day when it was a separate company. But the problem is it's now sold as a subscription, so if you want the Visio add-on to Microsoft Office 365, you've got to be willing to spend, what, $7.95 a month, 8 bucks a month. Right? So, but let's try it, and this will be the, the so graduate study bound. And, and you can pick what you want to do. This is the beginning. I decide to go to graduate school. Okay, that's, that's your starting point, right? And then your ending point is a submitted application. And you can make it to grad school, to law school, or med school. Don't do all three. Just do one, right? Don't make it, make it so darn complex. And then all you have to do, see, I've already given you. So I've decided to go to graduate school. And this is the completion of the process, a submitted application to graduate school. So all you guys have to do is fill the shit in between. That's all. <laughs> All right, so, uh, and, and you can see in the assignment there's quite a bit more to it than that, and it's, it's pretty well spelled out in the assignment, reasonably well spelled out. Uh, I expect to have to talk to, to folks about it and, and help you all with it. So, now systems models, right, are more general than flowcharts, and a flowchart, think about it, depicts a process, right? A systems model depicts many processes. 
Uh, if we think about manufacturing a car, we say, well, okay, manufacturing a car is a process. Right? And you say, well, assembling the car. Is, is part of that, pro you know, because if you want to manufacture a car, <laughs> you got to design the car, and then you got to make the parts, and then you got to assemble the car. So a systems model is kind of the big overview, right? Each box in a system model is a flow chart unto itself, right? And, and so each process has its own flow chart. And, and systems models allow us the big picture. So I'm, I want to take a systems model. This, this is what we would do at the lumber mill. Uh, when I was in Northern California for three years, I worked at a lumber mill, and we were not actually the lumber mill, we were the remanufacturing mill. So the lumber mill takes logs and it turns them into large boards, all right, large pieces of lumber. We would then at the remanufacturing plant receive large pieces of lumber and turn it into smaller dimensional lumber, right? So that was kind of our reason for being. So what would happen? Big unit of lumber, and this is usually what we're talking about, is uh, lumber that's maybe four inches thick, up to 12 inches wide was our capacity. And let's say that we want to make two by 12s for people to make picnic benches. Ultimately, that's where it's going to go. So we get these big pieces of lumber, and we resaw them. So the first part of the process is to cut those boards in half thickness-wise. So we end up with a four-inch board going in, inch boards going out. That lumber has to be graded as to its quality so there's actually a person there who looks at each piece of lumber and then applies a, a grade letter on it, A, B, etc. Now based on that grade the lumber is sorted and goes to seven different holding trays. Right? Now someone controls the flow of lumber along those trays right? as part of the process. Ultimately what's wants to be done is we want to stick that lumber into units with separating sticks so that air can flow through and allow it to dry. Or it may be taken up to one of the dry kilns where it's uh, effectively dried that way. Tally the lumber for each unit. So what has to happen is once the lumber comes out, we know that the lumber is all 2 inch by 12 inch. That is 2 inches thick, 12 inches wide. But it can vary in length anywhere from 6 to 20 feet. Uh, and that's part of the process, uh, 6 to 20 feet. The idea is that longs will be 16, 18, and 20, so a unit of lumber will be 2 by 12s, but it'll vary in length anywhere from 16 to 18 to 20 feet. Right? Now the tally man takes that unit of lumber and he places a tag on it that says, hey, this has got 12 16 footers, 28 18 footers, and 48 20 footers. Right? So they know exactly what's in that uh, thing of lumber. And then the lumber is sent to dry wherever. Now, once the lumber is dry, it has to be plain smooth, that it has to be brought to dimension and smooth. So someone has to select lumber units to fill the orders. Right? And then finally, the lumber is sent to the planer and then sort it out to fill the order. Notice each one of these represents a different process. And as, uh, as I'm finishing up here, I remember when I was at the lumber mill, John Woods said, man, that tally man, all he does is walk around and count the units of lumber. He's got a lot of time on his hands. He says, this is an opportunity to save money. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to eliminate the tally man's job. And I'm just going to say, look, I know that's a, a unit of long, so it's got 16, 18, 20 footers. I'm just going to estimate the average length. And then, you know, when they go to send the lumber to the planer, right, we're just going to, on the basis, but what happened was he didn't anticipate that sometimes then there wasn't enough 20 footers or there wasn't enough 18 footers to fill the order. So then the planer had to stop and wait for the forklift driver to go find another unit bring it down and add it in to fill the order. Well, the problem was that takes time, and now we're using a whole bunch of lumber. So it's not a very good match, right? So, in fact, uh, it became very inefficient. He eliminated Tallyman's position at $12 an hour, but the cost really was astronomical in what that cost as far as waste and lost production time. So a lot of times it's better to understand. Now, actually, I solved this problem for Woods. He didn't appreciate it because he hated me. But I said, you know, 
maybe we can get by without the tally man since I'm the one who operates the machine that's sticking the units. It's possible, I think this is possible, and we demonstrated it was. They got me one of those little grocery counters that is, a, you just click the button. Inventory people used to, and it, one, two, three, and it just displays. And I said, while I'm operating the machine and the lumber's going by, I can click for 16 footers. I can count the number of 18 footers and just keep a running total of that number, right? And then when the unit's finished, I take the tally card and say, okay, there's X number of 16 footers. Oh yeah, there's X number of 18 footers and do the math. That leaves X number of 20 footers. So we could go back to using precision tallies that facilitated the selection, right? And then reduce costs at the planner. Note though, John Wood's opinion was we would save money by eliminating the tally man position. Unfortunately, it cost us money. So we had to improve the process to make, for, make up for that loss, if it was possible at all. What I'm talking about here, though, is using science to solve our problems. Let's get away from opinion. Let's get away from what sounds good, and let's verify it. Let's, let's put the numbers to it. Uh, so that is your task, then, is to, and, and remember, go back to the flow chart. So that will be your task. And we'll, uh, you can see in the assignment, the instructions are relatively complete. Uh, and obviously, what are you going to do if you have questions? Well, you can come to office hours or, or, or you're going to come to our uh, weekly meeting, whatever it takes to figure it out. Thank you, guys.